Hey, Justin, what was your first computer? It was a Commodore 64. Dad brought it home one day, and I've been playing with him ever since. Okay. Why you got it? I honestly don't know. He just uh, he just showed up one day with a computer um, and said, here we go. It's the family computer. It was a little out of the blue for us, but I was in the fourth grade, so it's not like I was really... Okay. And what you did with it? What was your first action with your with the computer? No. <laughs> uh, well, way back in the day, there was a magazine called Run Magazine, which I don't know if it got much publication outside the U.S., but they would send out like monthly, I guess, publications, and they'd have different programs in them. That sometimes it'd be games, sometimes it'd just be like weird video things, whatever. Mm -hmm. But they would come with source code, uh -huh. and you, you know, my brother and I would spend hours typing in the source code. Sometimes it was in Commodore Basic. Sometimes it was in machine language, it was called, which is just a bunch of um, three-digit numbers, basically, 0 to 55. Mm -hmm. um, and we'd spend hours typing them in. And then when we were done, we would uh, run them. And sometimes they'd be games, and sometimes they'd make noise. Or and this was the first thing you did with the computer. You bought magazine and tried you know, to, to, to copy the code. or Yeah, this was like 1980. 485 so you know there wasn't a whole lot going on um uh, with such things you know there obviously wasn't an internet to play around with um so yeah this magazine was our kind of a bridge to the wider world because there was literally nothing else around us okay um i got it set spectrum which was similar to 64 but the first thing i did i got the computer with a cassette and i just loaded a game and I really enjoyed the game, so I, this is what I remember. So I was uh, I was really fascinated by the game. And, and you didn't start playing; you just coded from day one. Well, there were definitely games um, like Summer Olympics. We played a lot of Summer Olympics. And oh, the joystick Winter destroyer! Olympics. Joystick, yeah. joystick yeah. destroyer! Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We went through many joysticks. Um, <laughs> sometimes we fixed them. Sometimes we replaced them. Okay. Um, it depends on what broke, right? Okay. So if the little mercury switch broke, you're kind of done. Go replace it. But if the little plastic rocker inside broke, you glue that back together. Okay. So okay. So what was your first application you wrote? Or I mean, at one point of time, there was something runnable on your machine, right? So I mean, uh, or application like or program or whatever. Because if you you know you probably rewrote the code from the magazine, so you wrote it first, make it run, and then refactor it a bit, I think, right? Or modify it. Uh, yeah, we would. Yeah. I, I suppose you could call it refactoring. We would tweak it and see what would what yeah. would work or what not. Um, the first thing I remember, and I, I'm sure this is not my first one, but it's the first one I remember that I wrote from scratch. Um, I had a friend who went to a school in a neighboring city, and their assignment was to to build like this triangle with the word trigonometry, okay. so that like the first row would have T, the second row would have R, the third row would have I. So it'd be like one, two, three, four, five, like each. It would be a, a triangle mm -hmm. filled out with trigonometry on each level. And so the assignment was to find from the top T all the way down to the bottom Y, how many paths through this triangle could you spell the word trigonometry, only going down left or right from each node. Oh. So I wrote a program that would not only calculate that, but like represent it visually. So you had like trigonometry written up in like white letters, and then it would color the letters yellow as it plotted the course down to the top. But this is already uh, fairly complex, good. right? I mean, if you would write it right now in a programming language of your choice, you will spend probably more than a day, right? Probably, uh, depending. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I guess it was complex. It was fun, and it, it certainly impressed all of his classmates, I suppose. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, it was fun to write. I wish I still had it. It's, I'm sure it's on a floppy disk somewhere in my mom's attic. Slowly you should rotting away. publish it on GitHub. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. That would be amazing. I wish I could. Yeah. Um, okay. And and you just did it for fun? Um, yeah. And you Back then, like, computers were new, you know, at least to mortals. Um, and it was kind of a fun, like, you know, sometimes you, you pick a problem. It's like, that's way too big. I don't really understand all of it. I don't know how I'm going to do this. But the idea of, like, tracing a tree, essentially, from top to bottom didn't seem that complicated. Um, it was, so it was a nice, like, bounded problem um, with an expected result that we could verify. Okay. So uh, why you were so fascinated by the computers? So I mean, was this like you no know, because of the 
entire environment or movies or whatever, war games, Star Wars, or what What was the reason that you like computers? Because, yeah, it's interesting always to find out, you know, why? Well, because, I grew up. Yeah, because now it's not like, you know, every kid is you know, fascinated by Raspi. And back then it was like this, right, almost. Yeah, I mean, computers were like high science fiction Yeah, you know, you'd see them in you'd see them in movies, and they'd take up like entire rooms, and it was just it was you know, it was just otherworldly. And so then they like have one in our house um, with you know, like there were some games that you that we would buy, um, you load them on audio cassette and stick them in the player, and it would take like five minutes to load. Uh, you know, it was just, it was just captivating. It's like a whole new world. I was already like I grew up out in the rural parts of Oklahoma, so there was. I could throw a rock from my house and not hit a neighboring house. Like there was just, there was kind of not much around. So I was already used to like reading books and watching movies. And so there was a whole lot of like mental escapism anyways. And then the computer came along and to some degree I could make my own worlds in there and escape yeah. into that. Um, and like, why wouldn't I at that point? Right. Mm -hmm. What else, what else have I got to do uh, in this house? Yeah, okay. How how lonely was your house? I mean, I mean, was it like, you know, one house and nothing else? Or were your neighbors? Or what? how how to imagine Oklahoma so for me? Well, I mean, we had neighbors on either side. Yeah. Um, how far away? One they? side was like my, it was like my entire family lived in this. Well, everyone around me was family. I'll put it that way. Okay. Um, and the house like to the, the north of us was like my mom's great aunt and uncle and mm -hmm. they were already old when i was a kid so okay. they weren't exactly like playmates and then on the other side was another cousin who was a generation ahead you know okay. super great love the guy um also not really a playmate so there just wasn't there wasn't there weren't any kids around okay um and i had i have two brothers and a sister so i had siblings to play with mm -hmm. but you can only play with siblings for so long before you want to so was it like a farming land around, or was it industry, or what? How to imagine, though, to Oklahoma? Not really. Uh, my dad worked at the Air Force Base. Ah, uh, okay. In uh, in Oklahoma City, and so his job was actually fairly technical. He worked on a number of different things. He worked on um, the CNC machines, like the okay. computer controlled um, yeah. milling machines. He worked on, you know, various laser related. Okay. He basically helped maintain and repair all this kind of high tech stuff. So he was kind of a, a high tech, kind of a nerdy sort of guy anyways. Okay. Um, I don't like to describe it like he was more of a hardware nerd where we, my brother and I ended up growing more software nerds. Okay. Um, you know, Jason. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, he was, he was a nerd and he kind of inspired us to be nerds. And when this computer showed up, it just kind of clicked for us. Hey, cool. So, and I assume, you know, the first, uh, first uh, software you wrote in basic, right? Yeah. It was Commodore basic for sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it was a very basic, I mean, mm -hmm. I don't think we wrote a Hello World program because that meme hadn't quite been born yet. Yeah, exactly. Now, of course, when you're exactly. So the first time I heard about Hello World was like in the 2000s. And so someone showed me this, it's like, why you call it Hello World? And he explained, mm -hmm. you have to write Hello World. It's like, why? This is a crap. It's so why are, why I should do this, right? And <laughs> I, I I already programmed something in C and C plus plus, and I think even in Java. And then someone came up and wrote, you know, Hello World. It's like, why are you doing this? Why it means hello world? It's like you don't know it. No, <laughs> this was actually funny. Yeah, yeah. And, then, and then yeah. Step one is you print hello world, and then step two you write a go to, so it just prints hello world forever as it scrolls off the screen. That's just yeah. Go sub. Go sub were the real. They, they, they were the freaks. They they, they used go sub. Yeah. You know, not not go to. Um. Okay. So the first program was uh the uh, triangle program. What was the next one? I don't know. Uh. Which is, you know, Actually, somehow memorable or interesting. Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of. I remember, I remember growing up. There was one hill that I could never quite climb, and it seems silly to talk about it now. But in the in Commodore Basic, there was this notion of a random access file, uh -huh. which it sounds so trivial now, but to my however old little brain, it's like I can't get this to work. I want to go to like this middle of this file and read or write or whatever, and that was like this high concept thing that I remember struggling with on the Commodore. Mm -hmm. And now, of course, in, in Java or C or whatever, it's a pretty, you know, mm -hmm. you seek with some sort of offset and then you start doing whatever you're supposed to do. Um, I remember playing with things like that and, and uh, writing various things to help, like, do various math assignments. 
you know, trigonometry, ironically, mm -hmm. um, among other things, just, you know, solving, I won't say basic math questions, but they were basic programs to solve math okay. equations of one form or another. What was the next programming language then? Uh, honestly, it was actually probably um, IBM PC Junior Basic, whatever flavor of Basic that was. Because um, Junior Basic, you said. Later, well, there's a there was a PC Junior. Okay. Um, that IBM put out, and my school got a handful of those. Okay. And by then, of course, my brother and I were fairly adept at writing computer programs. Uh, certainly more than. My, our classmates, uh, and definitely more than the teacher who was supposed to be teaching that class. Um, so we learned basic there. We wrote um, a, a football simulator. Okay. Where there was like a handful of American football. American of football, yeah. So there was a number of like offensive plays, a number of defensive plays, and like each player would like, I'm going to do this play in the defense, I'm going to do this play. And then they would like simulate how well you did. And so you could play like a whole football game that way it was uh trivial um but it was fun we played it quite a bit um should have been paying attention on uh, the uh, the pc junior so like special mas machine what was i never heard about pc junior what is it it was I, I think it was basically like a scaled down um pc computer okay, okay. So it, I, I don't know the specifics because, you know, back then, like... No, no, but just interesting. You, just, you didn't think about, like, processor speed or anything like that. But this was hard. Uh, but I think it's supposed to be, like, a lower budget, okay. um, lower end thing for, like, schools and everything to get, you know, people into it all, I suppose. Okay, so this was, like, math problem for football, right? Because I guess yeah, yeah. that the yeah. football is somehow statistic-related, right? So are you crazy I, I don't about stuff? I how it was resolved. Obviously, like a, a pass would be, you know, you'd have some sort of random chance of defeating the rush, for example. I don't know. There were probably some random probabilities. I attended once BA World in San Francisco, and I was invited to either football or baseball. I'm not sure anymore. But what I remember is uh, that the, I think it was baseball, but uh, because something happened, you know, for three minutes. And then there were loads of uh, huge spreadsheets which were displayed on the screen in San Francisco. And then five minutes, nothing happened. And everyone looked, you know, and the numbers and say, what's going on? This is so boring. And I, and I walked around and then I know um, I, 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 I picked some French fries with garlic, I remember, which was new to me. So uh, and, and, yes. and but yeah, but, uh, you know, the entire game was very suspicious to me. So this is more math than than action, actually. And 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 I just uh, <laughs> and everyone asked me, "No, you like that?" So I guess somehow, I mean, I I like you know the stadium and uh, just curious how it looks like. But the game, I, don't, I have no idea what happens there, right? I think it was baseball, right? Because the football would be probably more action, right? Yeah, I mean, b football gets a lot of flack because it's a whole lot of action and then stand around for five minutes, but. But but baseball. It, for for me it was uh, no action and just you know waiting for the numbers. I think this was baseball then, right? It sounds like baseball yeah. to me. For, uh, I mean soccer. Long. Yeah, I'm from Germany, but soccer for me is even worse. There's, there's uh, I mean there's there's no numbers and boring, right? So I would prefer something with numbers and boring than. That's fair. Okay, perfect. So uh, we probably have to cut it out, otherwise you get a lots of trouble, you know, with uh, the soccer and f and, and football and. But uh, Formula One is even worse. So I don't know. So watching sports is somehow boring. But um, next question is, after after um, your junior basic, or no, sorry, junior basic, junior PC basic experience, what is the next step? So after basic or after school? So uh, I mean, because uh, it seems like, a, like you really liked programming, right? So you program all the time. All the time, yeah. Yeah, somewhere along the lines, we picked up uh, Turbo Pascal. Okay, of course. Way back in the day, that was... Um, that was the most accessible language. I remember, like, even back then, I was a little bit of a language nerd. Like, once I learned one programming language, I wanted to learn more. Mm -hmm. I remember one, wanting to learn, learn things like, uh, there's one called Oberon. Um, ah, exactly. Yeah, there's a couple others. Uh, they're all uh, like Nicholas Verth or Worth or whatever. He yeah. had kind of a play, a hand in a couple different languages. And I remember, like, I want to learn these languages. But it was the 80s in Oklahoma. Uh, so the availability of any sort of resources on those languages was zero. Um, but we did do uh, Turbo Pascal for a while. And then in high school, I learned uh, a bit of C. And in mm -hmm. university, when I finally hit university, 
uh, my first course or two was in C. I took algorithms and data structures in C, mm -hmm. which was um, difficult. Um, and then my, you know, we took Fortran because that was still a thing yep. back then. Um, and then my senior year in college, You know the NAG from Fortran? I don't. This is the numerical library in Fortran. Oh, uh, we took, it was, uh, I forget, we didn't take much Fortran. I think it was mostly just to say, here's this language called Fortran that so, the whole world runs on. So I had to, uh, you know, to take classes from, from I would say, diabolical professor. And the professor, uh, uh, the teacher, uh, wanted us to use the NAC routines from C. What he, oh. what he, he didn't told us, I remember this right now, is that in the index in arrays in Fortran, it starts with un, n minus one and ends with zero. So basically the array was reversed, at least in the routine. And oh. in C, it was the other way around. So no one of us yeah. could achieve anything because if we know, uh, arrays everything, right? We, we, that there was like, you know, the numerical, I don't know, Runge, Kutta or stuff like that. I, and we had to, 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 you know, to, to, <laughs> to compute something and it never worked. And after a few days or weeks, he told us, yeah, because, you know, you have to, <laughs> to reverse the array first, you know, this was crazy. So Thanks, this is bro. my, if someone, yeah, if someone tells me, no, Fortran, I always remember the, uh, the NAC routines. And by the way, mm -hmm. uh, Oberon, I also remembered, and I was very similar to you at the beginning. I wanted to learn all the programming language. What also fascinated me, I forgot the name of the language where, um, what uh, on the sun machines you know the the uh bios is implemented you know uh what was the name of the language oh i have no idea the, the, a fourth fourth, fourth. okay yeah yeah this fourth and fortran and oberon because oberon sounds great right i never ne never saw yeah. oberon but i wanted to learn oberon this was <laughs> and turbo pascal I actually also implemented uh, turbo pascal was nice I, I remember the first time i accessed file was actually uh using turbo pascal uh, actually basic because it was just safe uh, this was an easy command but uh turbo pascal I, I had binary files or something like this i remember um which yeah. really fascinated me uh-huh okay yeah. so you used a little bit turbo pascal and then what uh, a little bit of c yeah um, of course here and there um a lot, actually. Algorithms class, you said. Yeah. I remember uh, we did um, self-balancing trees. Yeah. We did AVL trees mm -hmm. with union types in my data structures and algorithms class. Uh, and that was not fun. It all worked, except I always lost the bottom right-hand corner of my tree because I rotated something incorrectly. And, and of course, with now that pointer is just off into memory somewhere. Segmentation so fault, was, right? Uh, it never actually crashed. I just okay. lost that part of the tree. Um, <laughs> and I, I never quite got that resolved before the homework was, um, before the assignment was due. But apparently I did better than most of the rest of the class, so I at least took some solace in that. Um, but literally, um, I, I, don't, I don't know if it was the next year or not, but Java showed up. Okay. And when it came time for like the big senior projects, mm -hmm. um, the professor was like, "Here's this new language called Java." Like he didn't even know Java. Okay. And well, he knew it slightly better than the students. Yeah. Um, but it was like 1996. Okay. Um, Very beginning. Okay. No one had really used it before. Um, but I remember it being much nicer to work with than C was. Yeah. And so I assume on your college or university, so there were sun machines, probably right? Because otherwise. No, we were on uh, HP machines, oh. actually. And how did the professor got Java? I mean, 1996 was very early. I think Java came out in 1995. Yeah, I don't know how all that worked out. I mean, okay. might it might have been Sun. I remember most of the university network for engineering was uh, HP UX machines. For, for me, the same. Used. We had HP UX, yeah. and uh, the, uh, this was like uh, the, the workstations, which I actually... HP OpenView, I think, was the desktop CD or something. It was a uh -huh. nice, nice yeah. desktop, and with X eyes and X clock. So there were the eyes would track, you know, the mouse mouse movements. Yes, this is, the yeah. eyes will always follow the mouse. Yeah, yeah. This is what this was like. No, no, the 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 the, the, <laughs> the hacker attitude. Um, so um, yeah, exactly. So I had uh, exactly the same machines, HP UX and the uh, OpenView. I remember. I really like, you know, the look and feel. I try actually to replicate this with Linux, but it was harder to get the same. 
look and feel yeah. because it was CDE, KDE or CDE and Linux had something. CDE. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I guess we did have some machines because we did use CDE mm -hmm. and it was ugly, but it was graphical, so it was cool. Yeah. Okay, nice. Uh, and, and you studied in Oklahoma as well? I did. Okay. And this was computer science? Yes. The computer science program was so new. It was only like a year or two of being its own program. Same here. Shortly mm -hmm. before I got there, it used to be electrical engineering slash computer science. Okay. So it was just, it used to be just a subset of electrical engineering because no one knew what to do with it. Okay. By the time I had gotten there, they moved it to its own program, but it okay. was still basically electrical engineering. So I took like digital circuits mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But then they added in things like compilers and algorithms that like a normal EE student wouldn't necessarily get. Okay. So what happened after the study? So you, I think you learned, oh, okay, or even better, how, how you like Java back then. So Java started, you couldn't lose uh, yeah. your, your trees again, right? Because uh, <laughs> Java, it is harder to lose your subtree. Uh, it's doable, I suppose. <laughs> okay. uh, like, I mean, you can set something to null. You're like, where did that yeah, thing yeah, go? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, uh, but I, I'm a little surprised that my C program didn't crash. Yeah. Because um, it was a very large, fairly large chunk of memory that I just kind of like hunted off into the ether. My, my C programs always crash in C++ because I experimented a lot. I remember with the pointers, referencing, dereferencing, and I had several levels of pointers, and uh, I always get segmentation faults because I was fascinated yeah. by pointers. And then someone told me, you know, Java doesn't come with pointers. So I was a little bit disappointed because the, all the fun is gone. And then Java, you know, <laughs> this C, C in and C out and templates, no, whatever was fun, Java came without that. And then the explanation was because Java is safe. I was like, okay, but this is boring like hell. But uh, someone told me then, but Java is the, or not Java, Oak back then, but Oak is the truly object-oriented language. And that's I was hooked, okay? Then forget C++ and I would do Java because if something is really object-oriented, I want to learn, learn that, right? Yeah, that's actually what I loved about Java was like the whole malloc, unmalloc, is it a star or is it the ampersand? When yeah, exactly. Parameters? Like I, I would always get it, you know, I was a lazy college student, always getting it wrong. It's like, this is so annoying. And then Java came along, it's like, you don't have to care you just yeah. pass it, uh -huh. and it just it just magically works. And then when you're done with it, you just ignore it, and it, it goes away yeah. by itself. Music to my ears. JDK one one, I guess you started JDK one zero one one. Then it was, I think, um, I think one dot oh dot two. Yeah, was probably my first one. Yeah, and uh, I, mine was oak, and then one zero something, and uh, then what I really loved, you know, the uh, performance improvements. Was one 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 eight? I remember one one eight. This yeah. is where JIT came came out, and this was a huge difference. Yeah. yeah, and this was I was just completely fascinated by Java, and not only Java. I mean the language, but also you know the entire branding, Sun Microsystems. You know the coffee, and the entire thing was completely different than all other programming language. I would say. There's not just the language, but the branding and design and, and documentation and the JDC, Java Developer Connection. I don't know whether you remember JDC and the Duke and the Applets. That's so this was time. like, exactly, I could say, no, the, 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 the computers back then were something different and Java was also different back then. There was nothing comparable to Java, I would say. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, someone will probably tell me wrong, but I think it was one of the first like dominant languages to not come out of academia. Mm-hmm. You know, like even even Scala, which is, of course, much more recent, came out of um, the university, mm -hmm. at least. He, of course, has a long history in academia and research. Um, so I, I feel like Java was the first one to have like a really like dedicated paid marketing team to get behind yeah. it, mm -hmm. you know. With all the logos and the mascots and the, yeah, you know, which the whole which thing. impressed me because uh, it was something completely different, right? And uh, especially the coffee branding was genius because I like coffee and uh, and it, it looked really yeah. delicious. The coffee Java coffee is okay. This is great. <laughs> I mean, yeah. And then I was surprised the first time at Java One that is actually a Java coffee brand. So which I liked, it didn't know about that. I thought you know this Java is like the language and there is no Java Java coffee, but there is a Java coffee actually. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. So. You, what was your first program in Java then? Uh, we did. This was this is how long ago it was. Waterfall was the predominant, of course, me software methodology. Still is in some it's companies. 
still is. Back when SDLC was like the big acronym to throw around with uh, software projects. So there were um, what is SDLC? Of, Sorry, what was this? What what is that? Software development life cycle. Ah, okay, SDLC. Okay, yeah. It now we take it for granted, but then it was like this is the the height of professionalism, I guess. Um, but anyways, you know, there were a number of um, there were like feature points and and this and that and everything about you know how long it took or what features went in and, and this and that. You know, there were numbers assigned to them, yeah. and you put them into this formula to figure out like how how long should your estimate be mm-hmm. you know like all these features have like this weight and this value and blah 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 and you can calculate what your estimate should be for how long it should take and then afterwards you can look and see oh, oh it actually took this long and you do a calculation about like you know how much you should skew your next estimate based upon your last estimate and your actual before anyways all these numbers to calculate so we did a number of projects throughout like my senior capstone where we would go through that process. And mm-hmm. so we wrote programs to actually track all those numbers and perform mm-hmm. those calculations as part of the software process. So we act, we're actually using this process to build the software to track the process and sort of this kind of weird kind of feedback loop. Because it was like the first time I'd done like large scale, like, well, large, um, like computational, like complex um, calculations with inputs and outputs and regressions and feedback and everything. Um, that was fun. Yeah. And did the calculations work? Or the estimations uh, right? <laughs> are they ever? <laughs> yeah, exactly. The exactly. exactly. Um, I, I like to think that they got better. Um, yeah. But it was, it was so long ago. I passed the class. Yeah. So I'm going to say yes, they were a resounding success. Okay. Brilliant. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, this was one of the major projects at the university with Java? Uh, in that particular case, um, I had some other. I took a human computer interaction, okay. which was uh, a new field then, as you might imagine. Mm-hmm. Um, and we ended up doing 3D modeling, actually, okay. using uh, TCLTK, if, you, yep. if you're yep. familiar with that. Yeah. So we, uh, we wrote a program to render basically a 3D arm. So I'd like two arm segments and maybe like a hand segment. And then it had to like bend and focus and rotate around like an elbow and a shoulder and everything. And we did all that in TCL and that was not pleasant. TCL TK, right? This is the complete name. TCL TK. Yeah. I think. Right. Okay. Tickle TK. Or or tickle TK. Exactly. How the cool kids called it, if I recall correctly. Yeah. And after university, you started to, to work with Java immediately or? Tickle TK. Yes, actually, um, my senior year, I took a part-time position with a company that did Java. And then after I graduated, I went to work for them full-time. So what was your first Java IDE? You remember that? The first one I ever used was Together J. Ah. If you remember that. Yeah. One. But as an IDE, yeah. it was strange. I never used uh, Together J as an IDE. I used Together J as a UML tool. Uh, yeah, we did a little bit of that. Yeah, I... I did together J. It had this great kind of like online collaborative yeah. sort of environment where you could work with your coworker like across the office or in, you know yeah. across the internet. Um, it never worked quite well enough because networks were slow then, yeah. as were, as were all the renderings and everything. Um, I used together J for a long time. Um, I used Vim for quite a while professionally, actually. Uh, for, for quite some time until someone introduced me to Eclipse. Okay. So I used Eclipse for a while. So you uh, used not... Together J, Vim, and then Eclipse? Yes. I think I probably bounced back and forth between Together J and Vim. Very interesting on because uh, what was going on. I started with uh, Sun Java Studio Workshop, then uh, Boland, a lot of Boland, JBuilder. Uh, I didn't. Uh, I did use J. I forgot about Chief Builder. I did use J Builder for a while. Then, then Semantic Visual Cafe. I use also. I, yeah. I I I I like the IDEs a lot. Also the branding. You know, every IDE had different look and feel a little bit. I really yeah. enjoyed that. And uh, the, I this, wanted to work with um, Code Warrior from MetroWorks, but uh, I never managed to to work with that actually. And um, and then Eclipse came out. And I actually killed yeah. all the IDEs with Eclipse because Eclipse was so much better regarding refactoring. So the uh, yeah. from the beginning, it worked really well. And of course, Visual H for Java. I use also a lot in projects from IBM. Yeah. 
And Eclipse was like yep. the open source version of Visual Edge for Java, uh, was uh, similar. And then I used Eclipse actually a lot, and then NetBeans. So this was uh, from Eclipse. Then Eclipse was a little bit, you know, heavy on the plugin side. And then I lost interest in Eclipse and started with NetBeans because there were no plugins involved. It was a lot easier to set up and was very pragmatic yeah. and, and productive. And still like NetBeans, actually. And now I use Eclipse again, uh, not directly, but with Visual, Visual Studio Code, which is basically Eclipse behind the scenes. Right. <laughs> yeah, I used, um, I used Eclipse for a while. I would flirt with NetBeans because it was there. Um, but then I found uh, IntelliJ. Mm -hmm. for, I think it was just called IntelliJ back in the day. No, the company was called Idea. I, I Idea. Idea yeah. was the company name and IntelliJ. And uh, yeah. funny enough, I had IntelliJ mm -hmm. licenses from the beginning. What I never liked in IntelliJ were the shortcuts. They were really hard really? to remember. Yeah. Oh. St still. That's probably fair. Yeah. And I asked them, you know, know all... I, in a conference, why are you using those strange names? It's like... I, I, Command J or something was completely different than, than in. I mean, what I remember, Eclipse, I think, delete line was Command D, delete. Uh, or uh, Eclipse was Command E, erase. So I could remember. And IntelliJ was like Command K or Command J. And I say, or Command U or something, Command U. It's like, why? That's weird. And, and the, uh, I was uh, on the booth and they told me, yeah, because it's in Russian. And it means something in Russian. It's like, okay, but I mean, this is uh, not very helpful for me, right? And um, yeah. yeah, and and this is why I didn't use uh, IntelliJ more. But uh, what I really liked back then is you know, the, the, that we had so many IDs in Java. It was incredible, actually. Yeah, and now not so much. My uh, When people ask me, like, what's the keystroke for blah, blah, blah in IDEA? Uh, I never really know what to tell them because I've had the same... Uh, idea config that I've been using for over a decade now. Uh -huh. uh, and the original key map comes from, Vim. <laughs> I don't even remember where, um, but I, I keep bringing it forward and it's changed over time. But like a lot of the defaults have changed off of what I started with. So mine are always like slightly off and I have to, I have to stop and think about it sometimes. Yeah. Um, but now they're just part of my, my muscle memory. I don't have to think about it so much, except for when I switch between, uh, Linux and Windows, those key maps are slightly different. Mm -hmm. And that kind of trips me up sometimes. But. For me, it's a little bit different because uh, I'm a consultant. Sometimes I have to work you know, with different teams or sometimes I try you know, to teach developers to, to use the tool. And uh, therefore, I always try to use the default key bindings for the IDEs. So I'd not too too much customization. For instance, Visual Studio Code, I just learned you know all the key bindings out of the box, which come with Visual Studio Code, and that means the same. And, and I tried to, to learn it with IntelliJ, but for me it was too hard. And everyone told it's me, just... you have to change, you know, the key bindings. Like, but, but why? Why are you not providing something reasonable? You know, and this was never, <laughs> ne ne never, never clear to me. But it seems like I'm the only uh, developer who has uh, problems with that. All others just love IntelliJ, still like IntelliJ, except the key bindings. I cannot understand why they are not more memorable somehow. But um, OK. Yeah. You started with the company to work after university. What you did at the company in Java? Well, we were um, we were actually a little bit groundbreaking at this company. We were building systems for online grocery shopping. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And now you, if if I tell people that now, I go like, well, duh. Everyone shops for everything online. But this was um, 90, 1998. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was pre Y2K. It was pre dot com mm -hmm. bust. Um, and yeah, yeah, no one really knew. I mean, this is back when people thought like, let's, you know, buy a dog online or let's, you know, buy a car or a couch. Like, how are you going to get it there? Like, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Everyone was throwing everything at the internet, but the grocery shopping hadn't really taken off yet. And that's the space that we were in. Mm -hmm. Um, that company, it never really quite, um, found its footing. Unfortunately, there were, Webvan and Peapod kind of sucked all the air out of that particular room. Um, now, of course, there's you know a dozen different ways to buy groceries online. Did it was it fun. Work? You know, it was. Did the software that? actually work? The software? It did, yeah, we had we had a number of customers. Ours was slightly different because we didn't do like the delivery piece of it. What we did was um, we helped manage inventory and warehousing so that when customers would shop online. Uh, it, it's basically like the Amazon warehouse model where mm -hmm. you have people go pick it and pack it mm -hmm. and then you just show up and pick it up curbside, you know, mm -hmm. kind of how like if, if you went to 
Walmart today or whatever to buy your groceries. You'd shop online, you'd show up, someone would stick it in your car and you'd drive off. Mm-hmm. So that was our model. And we had a number of customers who, you know, were reasonably happy with it, but um, we which, just, we never could quite scale the business. Which, which server have you used back then? You've brought, you know, the server from scratch or you used what Java web server, for instance? Um, we, um, we were using pre-1.0 specs of like DSPs. Do you remember JHTML? Yeah. It was yeah, from, we were, from, uh, Dynamo ATG, right? Uh, it was in that era. Yeah. I it's, forget who yeah. originated it, but, yeah. but yeah, we, it was, uh, pre-1.0 Java EE. That stuff wasn't even out yet. We were building parts of it on, uh, using Corba. Of course. Um, mm-hmm. Back in the day, um, is that just what you did? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we built it all from scratch, which was because um, there weren't any, there wasn't anything to build on top yeah, of. Yeah, of at course. The time. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was fascinating. It was actually one of the best experiences I had, and it kind of cemented the love, my love for uh, startups. Because in a small enough shop, you kind of have to do a little bit of everything to yeah. get anything done, mm-hmm. and especially that early on in my career, you know, you get exposed to so many different aspects from development to what we now call operations, mm-hmm. you know, servers and databases and the like, um, you kind of got to got your hands on all of it because there was just literally no one else to do it. Yeah. Uh, and my first project is also a startup actually. And I was asking, oh, which server should we buy? So we bought an HP, uh, a four core, four CPU machine, and then you so, say, okay, now we have to install software on the machine, you know, so we did everything. And then, you know, the yeah. DevOps uh, movement came out. And for me, it was strange because we started as DevOps, actually. So at the beginning, there was nothing else but DevOps. We did everything, actually. We were responsible yep. that the software is running. And then what I remember, what then happened was someone got the idea that they should be separated. There should be dedicated people who just care about the machines and the development, and there was no term for it. But at the one point of time, we were separated for, from the admins, and then it was a bad decision. Then a, you know, a hype term was reintroduced called DevOps, and now we are doing DevOps, the same what we started with, actually. Well, that was the same era where you saw the QA teams being split off into separate dedicated teams that yeah. all they did was test. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. And there were even, I remember at Microsoft, there were articles that there were dedicated t- uh, test teams and developer teams and, and how they uh, operate. So for me, it was strange because we also had to test and we had no testers, right? No, yeah. De- yeah. So the, the, the funny story is we, we started with Agile actually without thinking. I, I, I'm not sure that you used the uh, waterfall techniques in the, in the startup, May, maybe officially, but actually everything was iterative, right? From the beginning. And the, yeah. the whole UMF, uh, UML and waterfall movement was also suspicious to me because I had to do it officially in larger projects. But what we did is we iterated like crazy because, you know, you cannot just in the Corba and server environment be waterfallish. It never worked actually. The waterfall process works if you have a very large company with an established customer base. But if you're in a startup, yeah. like you have to you have to iterate as quickly as you can and yeah. respond as quickly as you can because losing one customer could be catastrophic. Yeah, and, and so, if you yeah. wait for too long with the iterations, you will never find a problem, you know? So you have to iterate. Yep. You, you have to keep the software running. So th- th- this is the most important thing. Yeah. Yeah. What happens after the company, after grocery uh, revolution? Uh, nothing terribly revolutionary. I moved to Denver, took a company with a, uh, not really a financial company, more like a financial integrations company. We wrote software for banks okay. and credit unions. Okay. Um, it was interesting, I suppose. We actually, Java EE was getting closer to being a real thing, but not uh, not entirely. And it was really expensive, like mm-hmm. 10 grand per server or something absurd, yeah. or yeah. 80 grand, depending on what you're yeah. with. So we actually ended up writing our own application server. Of course. Um, as, as one does. Uh, I won't say it was terribly compliant necessarily, but it met all of our needs and created, it created a platform for you know, us to build everything else on top of. Um, so that was fun. I mean, we still use you know, JSPs from Sun because mm-hmm. no one wants to rewrite that sort of thing. But... Um, like all the method dispatch, I wrote a persistence layer um, that was automatic. Okay. So, like, if you had circular references, you could, you know, you could do a dot set b, and b would turn back and, and make that uh, relationship cyclical. If that's how it was 
mapped. Sometimes you had uni, unidirectional and you didn't want that, so it didn't do that. But, um, but yeah, so I helped write like a whole persistence layer. This is kind of pre-hibernate days. Um, I guess was, you, you you reused it tri trigonomy, um, you know, trigonometrical uh, pa exactly. pa path. You know what you did the, in the high school. You just you know reused the basic exactly. program, just, wrapped it in Java. Just keep revving it every few years, yeah. Um, but now that was fun. That was a massive project because um, we had to model the the legal requirements for for uh, bank accounts and uh, loans and. Mm -hmm. All the collateral and this and that for not all, not only all 50 states, but also federal regulations. Mm -hmm. So we had to build. We used uh, Blaze, mm -hmm. um, the rules engine Blaze, uh, way back in the day to help. Um, we had like all the lawyers writing the rules, and we'd integrate it via Blaze and and all that sort of stuff. So the UI was very dynamic in terms of how you'd walk through. Um, what is Blaze? Up, um, what is Blaze? Blaze, it's a, it's a rules engine, sort of like Drools. Okay, never heard about Blaze, um, so we'll have to look it up. I think Blaze still exists, Blaze DS or something like that. Yeah, this think, is what Blaze DS yeah. is what I do remember. Uh, I I think don't don't quote me on that because um, it, it's been a long long time. But as far as I know, Blaze is still around. As a, it, it was a commercial project as opposed to like Drools, which is like an open source. Yeah, I just. Thing. There were another rule engine which was very popular. So I have to think about that. So it was used a lot. Okay. Um, interesting. So you wrote your first application server. I think you remembered uh, you reused from JSP the JSP compiler, right? From Sun and uh, anything yeah, else. Yeah, we just yeah include that jar because ja I don't Jasper. Think on the team. Was it Jasper? The compiler? Yeah. Thing? Jasper, exactly. Yeah, that goes way back. I forgot yeah. about that. Yep. Because uh, what you could do is, uh, if uh, the JustPad compiled the JSPs to servlets, you could actually take a look at what, what was generated, and it generated uh -huh. a servlet behind the scenes with an entire source code, which was interesting yep. you know, to see, because you could um, see whether it is going to be executed perf performantly or fast or not. And um, fun enough, the JSPs were crazy fast back then, as I mean. It, uh, the you know 2000 era not so but after that they were the fastest available framework on earth so rails and everything was way slower than jsps huh. the uh the J the whole concept of jsp was actually a weekend project that some a group of people at sun were sitting around talking okay. like hey wouldn't it be crazy to blah 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 and so they were just as the story i've heard um they were just kind of you know who is involved? Around. This would be an interesting uh, guest, you know, to my podcast. I don't remember. Okay. I don't remember. That's you have to so drop long. me an email. You can probably go back and see who who wrote the original specs and figure out like who was guilty. Okay. But yeah, he he spent all weekend hacking out like the first basic compiler, mm -hmm. and it was essentially that you, you just you, you parse this text file and you you, out, you output servlet code. Yeah. Then gets compiled. Now we could sell it as server side rendering SSR, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yep. Pretty okay. Much. So what happened after Denver? Oh, by the way, why, why you moved to Denver? Just because of the company or you wanted to spend some yeah, time in Denver? that's where the job was. Okay. Yeah, my wife's family was there and they, they a friend was like, hey, you want to come work for us? And so they made an offer and I said, sure, why not? Cool. And uh, after Denver? Uh, well, I stayed in Denver for a while. That's where I started work at Sun. Um, How Sun happened? Yeah, Sun happened there. So I worked at Sun for about a year and a half and then Oracle bought us and I worked for there for... I worked for Oracle for about a year and a half. How it is possible? Because uh, as I remember, we spent a lot of time with Java once, and this was longer than one and a half year. Oh, let me, let me, let me. I know we have. That's... No, I take that. I take that back. I did independent. I, I was an independent contractor for a few years. Oh, God. that's how long ago it was. Yeah, so I was an independent contractor for my last few years in Denver. Then we moved to New York take a full-time job which then i left to go to sun okay never mind because as i met you i think I, I thought you always worked for sun was not true no no i um how we met actually so, so what's that how we met actually because uh for un as i we always met a java one and we had some it would have been at a java one yeah. yeah my first java one was 2000 2000 2001 yeah, my, my as well. But then we had also yeah. chats, uh, and you were involved in Glassfish somehow, right? With Glassfish? Yes, I worked when I was at Sun, I worked on Grizzly, 
exactly. which is the network layer. Mm -hmm. So I worked on that for a while. Um, I built uh, web sockets into Glassfish, mm -hmm. and I like to make this claim because it sounds cool to say, and I'm I'm like ninety eight percent sure that it's true. Um, it is. It was the first or one of the first WebSocket implementations inside a Java EE application server. Mm -hmm. uh, like the spec was literally being written as I was implementing. So um, I would participate on the mailing list and look at the, you know, the wire diagrams for the spec and I would like build a version. And then three weeks later, there'd be a new version with slightly different, you know, frame layouts. So I had to go back and rewrite parts of it. Mm -hmm. um, and that iterated for a while. Um, until the WebSocket spec finally went final. Then I know how we met because I also used WebSocket very early. Uh, by the way, do you want it to start at Sun or was it an accident? Accident. So it's like, was it your dream to work for Sun or, or just you know just happened? Um, yeah, it was definitely. I mean, Sun was the was the place to be. Yeah. Um, at that time. Yeah. Right. I, I it's still one of my favorite places to work. There were so many great people there. Um, but my brother um, had gotten a job there earlier. Mm -hmm. And then he emailed me one day and said, hey, there's this, you know, opening here. Do you want to apply? And I said, sure. So I applied and um, started working for the Glassfish team. Mm -hmm. And you worked on Grizzly and the um, the uh, implementation, what I used as a repl prior to WebSockets, was Comet. And from, uh, uh -huh. was the name of the Comet project? No, it was, Comet was the... Atmosphere? How is it called? Atmosphere? Yeah, I think atmosphere. so. Because at atmosphere, yeah. atmosphere. There's a Java.net yeah. atmosphere project, which uh, yep. which plugged into Glassfish, and you could uh, you could have a WebSocket like experiments, which was Comet based. So I used it a lot. It was it yeah. was Comet D. Yeah, exactly. Was that protocol? Yeah, um, that's because uh, Jean Francois wrote uh, exactly. both Grizzly and Atmosphere. atmosphere yeah, I worked exactly. with him for I worked with him my entire time at Sun. It was pretty mm -hmm. great. Yeah. And uh, Grizzly was uh, one of the first NIO implementations, right, of the HTTP. So this is why we used um, Glassfish with uh, Grizzly just, you know, because Glassfish was, this is how we met. Because with Glassfish, what you could do is you could open a lot of connections without, you know, uh, killing Glassfish. And um, what happened, actually, Glassfish was also scalable back then, that uh, the web server died in front of Glassfish because, you know, we tunneled through the uh, web server to Glassfish and it couldn't handle so many connections in Glassfish. So we had thousands of open connections and nothing happened back then. And we simulated web sockets, basically. I remember in one project, we were able to push data from host system via Glassfish to the clients and have, like, you know, interactive experience kind of and um this is how we met i think mailing this or something but i didn't knew that you actually implemented the websocket entirely and uh, i knew the uh, websocket lead from sun microsystem you know his name this was um he wrote um, actually, actually santiago santiago and the other guy santiago was like the low level guy there was like a sun manager who's who was in in charge of the websocket specification i think he wrote even a book about uh, websockets and um I can't remember his name yeah, I, I will have to look it up, and um, and uh, we in contact, but I had no idea that you were actually working on Grizzly. Uh -huh. Was it hard to implement yeah. the web sockets? It was. <laughs> As, uh, uh, well, it was definitely work. Um, it okay. was my first time um, implementing uh, a protocol. Yeah, how you did you it? Know, you wrote unit tests. You just imp implemented those. So, so how, how to approach such a thing? I I would write. Yeah, I would write unit tests. Um, and knowing that it was, it's a little bit of um, the snake eating its tail, that, you know, because if I write the unit test to test the server, so I wrote like a client, mm -hmm. um, like I can't be like 100% sure that like, you know, there are assumptions that I would make unknowingly in both the server and the client, right? Mm -hmm. So even though the client and server interrupter interoperated correctly, I, you know, it's hard to say this is a valid implementation of the websockets because both sides or subject to these kind of unknown assumptions. So apart from writing, using those tests, because they're easier to round trip that way, and I can inspect the frames and the packages as they came back and forth, I would write um, demo applications using um, Firefox or Chrome, okay. for example. Because mm -hmm. um, those were at least third party yeah. implementations. And even mm -hmm. though they may be wrong as well in some way, I had greater faith in them 
Yeah. You know, because it's Google. Um, so if it if an application from Chrome could interact correctly with my server side implementation, I had a reasonable degree of confidence that okay. everything was correct. So you've wrote a lot of JavaScript well, as well. Of you've wrote a lot of JavaScript uh, as well back then, right? Yeah. Not as much as you might think, but definitely more yeah, than I. A little bit. At least new WebSocket, you know, from new WebSocket. Right, right, exactly. Exactly. Um, mm -hmm. But I had some cool demos that I'd do. I'd do like, you know, like the yellow sticky notes. Mm -hmm. I had demos where you could create sticky notes in separate frames and write on them, and it would immediately render in both frames. I had Conway's Game of Life, uh -huh. where the game would run on the server, but you could view it on however many different wind frames. Uh, tabs or whatever you wanted in a browser mm -hmm. and you could you could restart the game in one browser window and all the others would then update because it, it was all synchronized via web sockets on the server um just stuff to kind of show it off it was when, fun when was it roughly your web sockets work at, at sun when was it yeah when uh this would have been 2010, 2011. Okay. I'm sure. I I moved to New York in 2007, and then I worked a couple of years at a company here, and then went to Sun. So it might maybe closer to 2011, 2012. Okay. Go look. I I, I have a I, I saw I still have a GitHub repo on my Grizzly WebSocket demos. Okay. So I have to go check those. Yeah, they could be still relevant. I would check your demos again because. Uh... Uh, they might still run. Yeah, I'd be why surprised. Not? Just, uh, were, you also, still run. were you also involved in Tyros, the uh, reference implementation of uh, client side? Uh, I was just talking to someone about that. I was not. Okay. My understanding is that when Tyros was launched, uh, that they took the Grizzly WebSocket implementation as the basis okay. and then built Tyros out from that. But I... I only heard that kind of secondhand after the fact, and I was not involved in Tyrus as much as I wanted to be. Okay. And actually been kind of petitioning internally within Sun to start a JSR for WebSockets because I saw the way that, you know, there were like 14 different HTTP clients out there and none of them really quite worked the same way. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted to get a JSR out in front of all of that for WebSockets. So we have like a common API Mm -hmm. for WebSockets, um, and no one listened to me until one day another group showed up with a JSR that got submitted and accepted. Yeah, and the guy and had, I served on the expert group was Danny, Danny Cowart, which... Uh, That's it, yeah. Yeah, this is, yeah, this is exactly what... Uh, yeah. I'm, yeah, I met him several times. We had chats about WebSockets. But uh, your work and, of course, Justin Lee, you, were, you are on the spec. Yes. Okay. So I, you, I was on the expert group. At the time, I was a little miffed because, like, I wanted to be at least like co spec lead because I'd worked so hard uh, yeah. on the implementation for so long. But I have to say, those guys work hard, those spec leads. Yeah. And, uh, and the guys who ran it did a great job. And I'm actually glad that it wasn't me <laughs> because it is, it is a lot of really hard work and it's not always the most. Exactly. The most so I, I, I was always an you know, external freelancer, and I wanted to contribute, but alone, you know, to reading the emails for me was mission impossible. You yeah. know, the amount of text you have to read to participate in such a spec was crazy. So, uh, and, and there were people who wrote, you know, email like you know two pages. So, so for me, it, I, I was okay. I, I got you know every day was... like 30, 40 emails in my mailbox from different specs. So I read them and tried to 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 say something. But this was crazy. So you have to spend you know a significant amount of time with the specifications. So I think, yeah. Um, it, Especially that when you had to know mm -hmm. you had to know the WebSocket spec itself from the yeah. uh, the one WG. In the servlet spec, you had to know really well, mm -hmm. um, and also at the same around the same time was the async spec that was coming around mm -hmm. within servlets, and it all had to kind of work mm -hmm. together mostly um, mm -hmm. in one form or another. Like you couldn't trample on one spec for another, so it was complicated. Um, and yeah. what was the coolest project you heard about that back then? You know, which where Glassfish was used with web sockets. Was this anything you 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 heard about? Because... I don't know that I ever heard of anyone. Directly using WebSockets, um, 
I could kind of see the writing on the wall for what I, I still love web sockets. Um, and yeah. I'm a big fan. Um, but about that same time was the same time when you had protocols like Bosch, if you remember that. Mm-hmm. Um, you had um, I call it Spidey, but it was Speedy S P D Y mm-hmm. out of Google. Yeah. Um, um, Spidey uh, eventually became the basis for H- HTTP two. Yeah. Um, which solved like eighty percent of what web sockets were trying to fix. Yeah, but you, you know. cannot push with HTTP two really. So WebSockets is more. We we actually use WebSockets right. still because you can easily push data to the browser. And with HTTP two push, you can only push you know static assets. So you cannot just invoke JavaScript from the server. You know what I mean? Right. So this is yeah. completely different. And WebSockets is a little bit hard to not scale to operate in cloud-like environments because you always have to know yeah. to come back to the same node. So this is a little bit problematic. Yeah, the whole sticky session problem was... Yeah. was it still is. And, and, and yeah. sockets are very relevant, I would say, web sockets And uh, SSE and web sockets we use it a lot, especially right now with event-driven architectures with Kafka together. You know, it is uh, just beautiful because you yeah. have asynchronous communication in the backend and you can propagate, you know, the uh, calls to the client. So it's very relevant work you did back then. Yeah, I, I think if I remember correctly, um, we had talked about using something like WebSockets for clustering, like mm-hmm. inside of an app, app server, mm-hmm. um, because you know each each node in your cluster had to have some method of synchronization and communication. And WebSockets were ideal because you could just they were tunneled over HTTP S technically, um, and so you could have like cross data center communications without having to worry too much about ports and firewalls and this and that. Um, I want to say that was part of the conversations internally, um, but that was right up around the time that Oracle bought Sun. Yeah. So all of our clustering all of our clustering plans got put on the shelf. Yeah. What did you do at Oracle then? Uh, at Oracle, I did most mostly the same sorts of work. Okay. Um, I think that's actually where most of the... WebSockets um, spec work was done, was post acquisition. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so I, I did, yeah, most of the same, a bit more grisly work here and there. Um, yeah. Well, then you quit and you worked for Mongo or something like this, right? I went to Squarespace. First. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I, I went to Squarespace when no one really knew who we were. Yeah. Um, and uh, I worked there for a number of years, and uh, it was after I, I I left Squarespace to go to Mongo. But it was after I left Squarespace that they really started like their big marketing campaigns. So especially yeah. like here in New York, if you ever took a, a cab from the airport or if you rode in the subway, you saw an, a Squarespace ad. Yeah. They were just everywhere. And the Squarespace and, is the um, company which creates a CMS like great. Uh, I mean, this is like uh, uh, how to call it. Uh, what you see is what you get. Editor with uh, right, which is really looks nice and is great. And uh, yeah. they are using Java on the back end, which is surprising, right? Yes, the front end. Now this is all years ago, so I, I'm I'm hoping that they've upgraded. Um, the front end is just massive amounts of JavaScript. It was like a like ninety thousand lines of JavaScript mm-hmm. to manage the front end. Mm-hmm. They they used the uh, the YUI the Yahoo UI toolkit, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and it was the the largest or second largest application outside of Yahoo that used that toolkit. Okay. I don't know I don't know what they use now. Yeah, um, for the front I end. don't think so. But um, and the backend this was Java. The backend was Java. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was a mixture of MySQL and MongoDB, which is actually where I got my first taste of MongoDB work. Was was there. Ah, this is why you 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 wrote a JPA like access to Mongo, right? Uh, well, I I didn't write it. It was already kind of there. Um, mm-hmm. We used it at Squarespace. Um, it's called Morphia. Morphia. Mm-hmm. Um, and a guy named Scott had started it and got hired by Mongo. And then almost as soon as he got inside Mongo, he abandoned Morphia to go write C plus plus on the server. Uh, and so part of what I was hired. And Mongo to do was to pick up Morphia and to revive that. Okay, because it was a it was a company supported project. And this time. is where we so also remember that we met at Java One and had to talk about the JPA stuff and Morphia. So this uh-huh. is um, in MongoDB, and it's still operational. Yep. The Morphia, you know it. Morphia, is, yeah. 
Uh, yes. It, um, so I, I worked at Mongo for almost four years working on the Java driver. And wow. The, uh, okay. And uh, I did some Hadoop stuff, some Spark stuff, a uh, handful of other things. Uh, and then I left to go to a different company. Um, but after I left Mongo, there was no one really there taking care of Morphia. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I still had a huge fondness and connection to the project. So I had actually forked Morphia, and I was working on what I was going to recommend as a 2.0. Okay. Uh, and eventually I realized, like, there's very little being done inside Mongo on Morphia itself. They just had other areas to focus on. So I emailed my old um, boss and coworker and said, hey, if you guys aren't doing anything with this, I would love to take it over as a community project and maintain it. Uh, so they talked about it internally and blah, blah, blah. Um, and eventually they did um, hand it over as a community project. And so now I am the maintainer um, and primary contributor to it as as a project outside of more, uh, MongoDB. Wow. In fact, I'm, I'm coming up on doing a new release um, here in just a few days, I think. This is a great news. And, and would you say that uh, your project is the preferred way to talk to Mongo from Java? Uh, well, that's always a tricky thing to say. Um, there, are, there are a number of Java libraries for that. Spring, or, of course, has their own. With, or what is, the reason, what is the reason not to use your library? Well, if you're in the Spring world, um, they have Spring data MongoDB, I think. Okay. So if you're already in Spring, it would make probably more sense to just stick with that because all the integration with the wider okay. ecosystem um, is there. If you don't want to use um, Spring, then for me, um, Morphia would be the ideal choice because um, it's self-contained, it's actively maintained. Um, there are other libraries, but they, te- they seem to be a little bit more mm-hmm. niche mm-hmm. Um, in their usage and popularity. I could be mistaken, um, but it seems... It, it seems like either Morphe or Spring Data are the most common choices. Okay. What we should do, I should re-invite you back and just talk about Morphia, if you if you like. Just you know, uh, we could do that. Yeah. You know, from from how it works and, and and you know how to connect to MongoDB with Morphia about you know this could be actually a fun topic if yeah. if you like. Um, yeah, that'd be great. Um, I'm actually I'm I'm excited about this upcoming release because apart from some nice bug feet fixes and everything um is it actually gives me a place to kind of bookmark it because there are some uh enhancements i want to make to morphia based on what i've learned working on Quarkus. some some ideas i've had on how to optimize the runtime of morphia Uh in terms of like all all the reflective use and this and that so you are working on Quarkus right now yes yeah i've been on the Quarkus team for a couple of years now couple of years. So Quarkus is like two yeah. years old, I would say, right? Yeah, when I joined, Quarkus was like nine months old or so. Okay. It was not a public project when I joined. Okay. It had a whole different name and we weren't allowed to talk about it publicly. Um, what was the name? Because uh, I'm not sure I'm allowed to say. Okay. They're weird, like legal, trademarky. Okay. I, I don't know. I think it's out there and people do it, but I, I don't want to put my foot in my mouth by Okay. Uh, no, no, no problem. And and um, how you joined Red Hat just because you wanted, or was it an accident, or what? Well, um, when I left MongoDB, I went to work for a company that involved a move to Sweden. Uh-huh. Um, without getting too off into the weeds, um, my job there was supposed to have been uh, like an engineering lead slash manager to help the data team build stuff. Um, that didn't work out for a number of reasons. Uh, primarily, six months after the company moved me and my family to Sweden, they decided to change direction um, as a company, and they closed a number of offices around the world, including the one they just moved me to. Okay. <laughs> uh, and so uh, they were, you know, it was terrible timing for me personally, but the company itself was great. They said, we know we just moved you here. If you would like to move back because of the, this action here, we will pay to move you back to the U.S., mm-hmm. which they did. Um, so everything else notwithstanding, that was a very gracious move on their part. Um, 
So kudos to them. But in the process of moving back, I, I had tweeted like, well, all right, looks like looks like I'm moving back to the U.S. and I'm looking to get a job. And so um, I had some people from Red Hat reach out and say, hey, okay, ping me and we'll work on something. Um, and so they worked hard to get me pulled into Red Hat. Which was great because Red Hat, um, much like Sun, was kind of a bucket list company for me. There's yeah, um, I, I, I mean, a lot of I, I, I still, Sun guys working for Red Hat right now, right? This is not uh, uh, yeah, some of yeah. them. Um, and I, I still feel sometimes like just so terribly lucky because like I grew, I you know I've grown up with the Java ecosystem, yeah. and there are so many like like really like big names and significant contributors to the Java ecosystem. And I get to work with some of those people. Mm -hmm. um, and it is one of the most gratifying and intimidating experiences of my professional career because um, there are some just really, really, really smart people on my team. Mm -hmm. It's it's a lot of fun to work with them, mm -hmm. uh, even if sometimes I feel like, you know, the kid in the corner eating paste sometimes <laughs> with some of the stuff going on. But yeah, cool. What you did in the Quarkus team? What, what, what was your, your job there? Uh, I, I, I kind of bounce around a lot for reasons. One of the things that I'm involved with is the MongoDB integration, although that is less than one might expect given my experience. Um, but that is part of it. Um, my primary work right now actually is in Kotlin integration. Uh -huh. um, so as a project, we want to support Kotlin as best as we can. And so I, I've been primarily responsible for trying to where necessary, introduce Kotlin um, interfaces or or tweak the behind the scenes behavior of the Java code so that Kotlin applications work much more seamlessly on top of Quarkus. Mm -hmm. Okay. So a lot of bytecode manipulation. It's um, sometimes just tweaking the Java code in the background to not make certain assumptions about how things work. Because a Kotlin's con Kotlin works a little bit differently under the covers, even though it's all the same bytecode. Okay, so after Kotlin is done, you should now try Oberon again, right, on Quarkus. I, sh I should look and see <laughs> if that's still a thing, right? Oberon for the JVM, how, how cool would that be, huh? Yeah, so nice. I would say I we have to talk again uh, about Morphia. And, uh, yeah, that'd be great. And Quarkus, because uh, you know MongoDB is a popular database, and uh, it's a, it's a, it's a actually to have a choice to access, you know, um, MongoDB from Java using JPA like is like feeling. It's actually interesting, right? So, yeah. Well, from the I don't want to go too much into it unless you really want to. Um, we have we have a a wrapper around the Mongo Java driver. Uh -huh. uh, in Quarkus. So if you use the Java driver, we have an API that makes it, the the queries at least, um, a little bit nicer okay. uh, to work with. Um, but of course, we also have like the Hibernate layer. So any RDBMS you want to use, um, you can use. If you if you can use it with Hibernate, you can use Quarkus on top of that. Okay. So now, uh, where people can find you on the internet? So what is what are the resources? You know, your Twitter, GitHub? Just well, fortunately, yourself. it's all this... Mm -hmm. It's all the same. Um, I go by Evan Chuli online. E V A N. Why this? Uh, why this? All right. Um, it's a it's an English phonetic joke. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's a play on the word eventually. Ah. Evan Chuli eventually. Okay. Um, I have a I have a penchant for really bad puns and groaner dad jokes. Um, it's just it's what I like to do. Um, and I was getting some flack from a guy I used to work with about my previous um, handle. I think it was actually an AOL instant, AOL instant Messenger handle. That's how long ago it was. Okay. He didn't like he didn't like my last one, so he said you've got to come up with something new. So I came up with that one, and he didn't like that one so much either. But I loved it, and so that's been me since. But uh, it is E V A N C H O O L Y Evan Chuli. Um, and that's my Twitter handle. That's my GitHub handle. Um, yeah. I don't know if there's any What other I Twitter thought, here. that this is even, like even, see, holy, you know? Ah. Is, uh, 
e even holy and the c is just between because you couldn't get it so you wanted to be the even holy so holy even so i was oh, okay i wanted to ask you all the time you know what does even holy mean actually so um you know i have no idea what that means yeah, yeah perfect it's just a really bad joke that okay. kind of Eventually, eventually is actually yeah. interesting right so this is uh yeah so perfect uh thank you for for your time actually and it was great to talk actually, you know, about yeah, thanks for having me yeah perfect